So some of the things I'm going to say are prob have probably already been said, but as one of my friends who is uh, a preacher says, the world shall be saved by repetition. <laughs> uh, so why do we have consent? Well, I think that there are a number of different ethical answers to this. There's the answer I might give as a professional ethicist. Then there's an answer which deals with sort of the fossilized or regulated ethics that we have in research ethics regulation, which may or may not have something to do with ethics. But it's very important when we talk about ethics that we make that distinction uh, because our current regulations may not uh, be ideal. Uh, now, why do we want to have informed consent? Well, in my view, informed consent essentially has very little value in itself. It has value because it protects other things. It's a means of doing other things. Uh, now, of course, it's very important because it has become incredibly central in our research ethics regulation. And how central it is, we can see if we, th if we think of all the kind of persons who can't give consent, well, how do we try to solve that situation? Well, we have to find the consent equivalent. Uh, sort of the, f the first thing we grasp for is when we can't have consent is something that looks like consent. Uh, but essentially, what I want to say something about is, well, if we think about sort of what are the protection, what are the things that we want to protect, uh, can we do that without informed consent? I think it's also important when we think about the regulatory side to think about the fact that our regulations come out of a particular paradigm. The paradigm is the randomized clinical trial taking place in a hospital where a healthcare professional meets patients face to face. Uh, finally, uh, I don't know whether anyone has discussed it yet, but of course, consent is not the complete protective package. The complete protective package is consent and the right to withdraw. Uh, because the patient of research participant may have misunderstood what the project is about and or may simply have changed his or her mind. Uh, and some of the things we want to protect, we can only protect if people can withdraw. Uh, and of course, it's a precondition for withdrawing from something that you actually know that you are in it. <laughs> Uh, but we have to think about withdrawal as well. Now, in the rest of my talk, I will focus on the consent component, but I'm fully in agreement uh, with Clive that sort of the in information component of informed consent has over time sort of increased and increased and increased in the level of detail. And it's time to rethink that component as well and think, well, for this particular type of research, how much information is really needed for patients to make a decision whether they want to become research participants. Now, in my view, consent is here because it protects at least five <coughs> ethical values. The first is the value that we don't impose harm on other people uh, without their permission. We don't impose burdens on other people without their permission. And then there are at least three plausible rights that people have. Uh, which we also protect by consent. They have a right to self-determination. They have a right to control their own lives. Uh, what projects broadly conceived they want to participate in and what projects they don't want to participate in. Uh, 
they have a right to bodily integrity, which is separate from the right to self-determination. Uh, and they have a right which, and we can have long discussions about how we best characterize it, but they have a right in relation to information about themselves to have some control over how this personal information is used. Uh, I'm going here to focus on how we can, pro can protect these things in relation to people who are randomized to be in a control group. Uh, and there I think it's important just to remind ourselves that in a standard randomized clinical trial, it's very rare that the control group actually gets standard care. In most randomized clinical trials, we impose additional burdens on the participants. Uh, these might be as simple as we want to see them more time in the more times in the outpatient department, but we all have to remember that a half hour appointment in the outpatient department is really half a day gone of your life. Uh, so the control group in almost all of a sort of standard randomized clinical trials there will be some extra imposition of burden on them, and there might also be risk of harms in, in relation to some of the, ex, for instance, extra <coughs> diagnostic tests we do, and so on. Uh, then I think informed consent also protects a set of reasonable expectations that people have and which they derive from the expectation of what happens when patients meet healthcare professionals. Uh, we expect when we go to see our GP that we are involved in healthcare decisions that have a major impact on us. Uh, we expect that when things happen that are not usual in a patient healthcare professional relationship, we are told that these things happen. Uh, and sort of one of the uh, very consistent findings from studies of informed consent to research is that a large number of potential research participants do not understand randomization. And the most plausible explanation is that if I went to my GP and he said, well, Soren, you're a medical doctor, you know that I can treat this with 12 different drugs. They are sort of roughly equally good, so let's spin this roulette wheel and choose which one you should have. I would immediately change my GP. Uh, randomization is simply not part of what we think healthcare professionals should do when they choose uh, treatments for us. Uh, and I would also, I think it's also a reasonable expectation that if I'm exposed to extra risk of burdens that are not a necessary part of my treatment or care, I'm told about it. Uh, so informed consent also protects these kinds of reasonable expectations and we can discuss whether there are more and we could have long discussions about whether people are right in expecting these things uh, but they are mainly irrelevant if they actually expect them. Uh, so why do we have consent and well uh, because if we take harm, if I'm told of the extra risk of harm in participating in this particular research project, I can consent to them and I can make them part of my own project. And I can say, yeah, I'm willing to take on this extra risk of harm for the benefit of society or because it's going to be uh, 
important for the group of patients I belong to or for whatever reasons I do it. Uh, I can obviously consent to the extra burden of having to have an MRI scan or having to turn up at the hospital more times than I otherwise would. Uh, I can consent to what would otherwise be rights violations. I can consent to you sticking more needles into my body than you would otherwise do, uh, and so on. And I can consent to randomization. Uh, I can consent to my healthcare professional doing something which in the normal context would be uh, very strange. Uh, and of course, then we have to think, well, can we have alternative protections? Well, some of these things we can simply design out, because it's important when we talk about imposition of harm. In a lot of studies that we do or want to do, the main harm comes simply, or the main risk of harm comes simply from the fact that the participants have a fairly terrible disease which has to be treated in fairly terrible ways, whichever of the two arms of the study or more arms they end up in. So these are risks in the research, but they're not risks that are created by the research. So we have to think about, well, it's the additional risks, the additional risk of harm, and we can design that out for the control group so that there are no additional risk of harm. We can design extra burdens out. Uh, we can design additional interventions out which impinge on bodily integrity and privacy. Uh, now we can't uh, really design out the protection of my self-determination. Uh, but of course, we can do other things we can have in relation to Twix. We can have prior general consent to various procedures. Uh, or we can have a model where you have prior general consent, but actually inform people in a control group that they are in a control group so that they have a transparent opportunity to withdraw if we decide that that is important. And the same, of course, we can do for issues of uh, related to breaches of people's reasonable expectations. Uh, and similarly, the, uh, the question that Amanda Hahn raised around uh, the use of data, uh, of course, we might solve that also with prior general consent or some, some other method. Uh, so let me try uh, and sort of elicit your intuition. So we have a cohort. We have assembled it. We have consented everyone in this cohort for the use of their data to research interesting research questions which are related to a specific condition or a set of conditions. At some point, we draw a random sample from the cohort and we consent this sample for a trial of a new intervention. Uh, at some later point, we have performed this intervention, we stop the trial, and we match the cases, those that have been randomly selected, uh, with controls from the cohort. And since this is a case control study, and since people have already consented to the use of the data, we do not seek the consent of the match controls. So the people who have the intervention know that they have been uh, selected randomly to have it uh, and have consented to having this particular intervention, but we use a uh, case control design. Now, 
I would be willing to argue that this is ethically okay. Uh, that essentially the people who later becomes the controls have already consented to everything that is involved in this. Now, if you think the same, then you should also think, my argument be that the following design is okay. That we have a co cohort which is assembled and consented for use of data to research questions related to a specific condition or set of conditions. We draw a random sample and we draw a random control sample at the same time. Uh, but we only consent the people who are getting the new intervention. And we, when we have performed the intervention, we stop the trial and analyze the data, still without seeking uh, consent from the control group. Uh, now, why should you think that this is the same? Uh, well, you should think that this is the same because essentially nothing different happens to the control group. Uh, their data is collected because they're part of the cohort, not because they're part of this randomized controlled trial. Uh, we don't do anything that we wouldn't have done otherwise, and so on. Now, of course, you might think it can't be the same because the clinical trials directive says that it isn't the same. Uh, but then that is where you have to remember the distinction between ethics ethics and regulation ethics, which are two different things. So when should control groups consent? Well, my tentative answer is, well, if there is no priority on consent data use in the relevant context, uh, if a trial imposes extra risks or burden on the control group, or if a trial involves arms with treatments that are so different that a reasonable person could prefer one over the other, even in a situation of clinical equipoise concerning effectiveness. I was quite pleased when I got the invitation to speak here because one of the things, sort of when I became interested in research ethics, which is many years ago, well, partly one of the reasons I became interested uh, was a particular Danish scandal. Uh, which involved cell and randomization. Uh, and at that point, in the mid-1980s, uh, it wasn't known for certain early stage breast cancers whether mastectomy, uh, which was a standard treatment, could be replaced by lumpectomy. Uh, and Danish researchers wanted to answer this question and in their pilot, they had used fully informed consent in both the uh, control group, which would <coughs> get mastectomy, or the new intervention group, which would get the lumpectomy. And they had found that women were not willing to consent to randomization. Uh, even though they did their best to explain to these women that, well, we don't know which one of these interventions is the better one. We are in absolute clinical equipoise. The whole community is in clinical equipoise. Uh, women were unwilling to consent. Uh, so the Danish researchers then thought, well, we'll do this by cell randomization. So we don't have to ask the control group. Uh, and not surprisingly, they got very nice consent rates in the intervention group. Uh, now, the, the researcher who then uh, went public and denounced this in a Danish magazine called Ad for Damon, Everything for the Ladies, uh, became the man of the year. Uh, he had found a way around this because he knew, he knew 
with this clinical expertise, which women should have which, uh, which treatments. And since they were at that time still randomizing by envelope, he just drew envelopes until he found one with the right treatment. Uh, so maybe he should not have become man of the year. Uh, but I think it just shows that there are, there are situations where people have perfectly understandable rational uh, preferences which are not related to the question of the effectiveness, even effectiveness broadly conceived of the treatment. And in those cases, we probably have to consent control groups as well. Uh, and of course, it's, I think it's important to note that the question of whether we should have people's consent is a different question to whether we should inform them so that if they want to, they can exercise uh, their right to withdraw from a particular project or part of a project. Thank you very much. Um, you left us kind of hanging with your last comment. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, although we use the term informed consent generally, as you point out, we haven't made a distinction, but I think people would be just as curious about whether there are transparency requirements in, so I think you made a very good case about consent. So could you say something about your thoughts about the uh, transparency requirement? For example, you put an asterisk in that final column and didn't, you didn't elaborate um, further So about these trials. No, I, I, I think sort of but my analysis would be that it depends on, on a number of things. The, fir the first is that it depends <laughs> on sort of whether it is true that we have sort of really designed out all extra burden or whether sort of in in the background, we are ensuring that sort of we have more complete data sets on those people in the cohort who, at this point in time, actually happens to be our control group. So I, I think if we start sort of imposing, we can have long discussions about where to draw the lines between insignificant and significant burdens on people and what they might be, then, then we have to at least inform them that something is going on which they could withdraw from and uh, if, if they wanted to. I think the other element is it depends on sort of my view would be that the optimal way to go is to have people's prior day on consent and as part of that telling them that so if you end up, if during a future randomization you end up in a control group, we'll tell you and you can withdraw from that uh, and then implement that. In that way, I think sort of it might be sort of an ethical belt and braces approach, but I think, I think that would be the optimal situation. Uh, now, of course, it it also depends on sort of what, why why do you have this cohort in the first place? Is it sort of primarily as a vehicle to do in cohort trials, or is it sort of for more traditional cohort purposes that you have it? So, I think I think there are lots of things that sort of go into that determination. Or both. Your presentation brought something I hadn't thought about so far yesterday, because the two examples had different points 
of identifying controls? And maybe that's a more general question to the people who have actually done TWICs. So in your first one, you identified the controls after the study had finished, the intervention had finished. In the second example, you identified controls at the beginning. So what is, what is normally done? And does it make any difference? Oh. Shall I answer the question? Yeah. What, what, what is the question? The question is when do you identify controls? Because there are two examples in this presentation. Mm -hmm. The first example, the controls were selected at the end of after <coughs> the intervention trial was completed. Um, but in Twix, on the other example, controls were selected uh, at the time of uh, selection of the intervention, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do in Twix is that we identify a sub of eligible patients, and from that sub uh, the intervention or the intervention group is randomly selected. So it's at the same time. Okay. But that period can actually be very, for example, we have one trial running, and that trial has been running since 2013. It's a very long conclusion, a long period. But controls and intervention are selected at the same time, and not afterwards. I just wanted to add that that again is different from the cohort that we are using, um, which I'll be presenting after the break, um, in which we actually do individual, individually randomize people into the control group or um, getting the intervention. And the control group is only followed up in the cohort. So we do not have one pool of people who we can so like we wait until someone meets eligibility criteria and then we basically just flip a coin. So we do not do random selection. We randomize them into control group or um, in the intervention group. Actually, that's what, that's what we also do. But it's, it's, I find it very difficult. What is random selection and what is... Because I agree with John that if you do not win the lottery, you're not allocated to the losers group. I agree with that. But in a way, you, you, you are randomly ending up in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the losers group, right? Yeah. So, so it, it very much depends on the intervention that, you, that you're looking at. But still, I think the timing is, you, the timing of selecting controls relative to your intervention arm is at the same time. It's not afterwards. No, no, it's no. at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation. I've never thought about the question of withdrawal as distinct from the question of consent. I mean, I assumed withdrawal goes along with consent, but they're separate. I've not seen that before. So from a behavioral economics point of view, an opt-out consent um, and an opt-in consent have very different effects, but the same moral status. So the different effects is an opt-out consent will have far fewer people uh, opting out than an opt-in consent will have people opting in. So if you want a high adherence or a high join rate, you use an opt-out consent. But from the point of view of the economist, these are of similar autonomy. So the patient is exerting a similar degree of autonomy by choosing not to opt out as they are by choosing to opt in, but it has a really wildly different outcome. In an ethical analysis, is there any difference between an opt-out consent with the same information set as there is with an opt-in consent. Are they different ethically, given the same basic information? Well, that, that, is, that is a good question. And I think the answer depends on, well, as always, it depends on a range of things, but it, but it, it depends very much, I think, on whether or not by doing the opt-out you somehow engender a sense of pre-commitment in the patient. It, well, if, if the patient, well, if, if the patient thinks that I'm going to disappoint the nice doctor, it, in front of me or, well, I have in some sense already said yes to this for the what? Why is that the difference between opt-in and opt-out? I'm sitting with the patient saying, will you join my trial? Why is there a sense of disappointment? Oh, I don't want to disappoint the doctor. Doctor, any different? I don't know. So I think the real question is if one avoids 
that disappointment is are they equivalent morally? I, I would think they are. Now, I, I think the important about also thinking about withdrawal is that that is your your opportunity that you have sort of during the time you are the re a research participant to say, no, it, there's something here that I didn't realize that I would have to do. I, I simply don't want to do it. So it provides a protection while you are a research participant, whereas informed consent is essentially a one-off at the beginning. Uh, is that an argument that informed consent is actually less, sorry, uh, yeah, informed consent, in other words, uh, opt-in, is actually a less respectful mechanism for getting consent than as it reduces autonomy? Is no, I, I, I don't think so, because, for, well, for, seen, seen from the point of view of it being done at a particular time point, uh, my view would be that, in many circumstances, they are equivalent. Uh, what they do is that they say, well, what I'm consenting to is, on the basis of my understanding of what the project is, I am willing to participate in this project. Uh, but my understanding of what the project is, or my understanding of whether I should trust you as a researcher, or many other things, may change over time while I'm a research participant. And that is what the right to withdrawal <coughs> uh, sort of opt out is not withdrawing. It's just saying, I don't want to be part of it, this at all. Withdrawal is at a later point where you say, well, something has changed, and I no longer want to be part of it. Can I, can I ask a question to the audience who's doing uh, tricks? Do you give your uh, participants opportunity to opt out at certain time intervals? We have this discussion every now and then in Utrecht. We don't, we, we give them, of course, they can opt, um, leave the study, leave the cohort anytime they want. But we don't ask them at regular intervals, are you still sure that you want to stay in the cohort or do you want to leave? We don't inform them about them being in control and giving them the opportunity to leave. Are there groups who do that? Um, so, my file is up and running it, it's still very much in the planning phase, but when um, I discuss with some ethicists in my university, the cohort is impatient with a limited life expectancy, um, and there was concern about the ethics of people signing up for a cohort when they didn't know how their uh, health would change, and not committing to something that they then you know, couldn't fulfil at a later date. So, we plan to have on our case report forms for the cohort, um, uh, sort of reconfirmed consent to every visit and okay. built into that we're going to have um, the option to step down to telephone follow-up and then withdraw completely if you know, at any point they become too frail or they don't want to do it anymore. Now whether that will work I don't know because we haven't uh, agreed on yet but that, that, that is going to be built into yeah. the study. It depends also on the size of your cohort because if you have thousands of patients that's a lot of, or hundreds of patients. Sort of right? Yeah, we, we don't have that many patients. Okay. Other? Oh, okay. uh, yeah, we, I wanted to do this thing about making consent really live. So was, when we did the second round of it, uh, the, getting routine outcomes from the Yorkshire Health Study to the whole cohort, so mm -hmm. 25,000 people, um, I asked them at the end, you know, do you, do you consent to continue to be in the cohort? And, uh, uh, and then, of course, some people just didn't reply. We didn't get the questionnaires mm -hmm. back. And then, so I ended up having to go to get a section 251 confidentiality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they ended up going to the information commissioners of this to discuss what would happen to, with the people, what if people originally consented but then didn't reply the second yeah. time, were they deemed to be still consenting or deemed not to be consenting? Mm -hmm. So it took me a year and a lot of forms. <laughs> anyway, the information commission office actually said that if they hadn't replied, they were still deemed that consent was still deemed to be live. Yeah. So. I then, after that, decided not to keep on. Because I knew, you know, it would take you know, three months of my life to actually fact, sort out a bureaucratic mess. So. And people always know that they can <coughs> withdraw because they don't actually fill the question mm -hmm. in, or they don't come up for treatment, or they don't, you know, so, and that right to withdraw is there, is written at the beginning of everything. So. And I, and I think that there's some very experienced, 
interesting experience from uh, the Norwegian Hunt Biobank and, and cohort because at a certain point in time they were deemed not to, no longer to be doing research with, within their original informed consent and were told by the Norwegian authorities that you have to write out to everyone and essentially offer them an opportunity to, to opt out. Uh, and just over 1% opted out. Uh, now, th this is a, a, a population-based cohort. So a couple of years later, everyone in the locality was uh, asked back for another round of clinical tests. And it turned out that about half of the people who had opted out then opted in again. <laughs> but would you suggest just somewhere in your presentation that as soon as you want to run a trial in your cohort, you, s you argue that you should inform the control arm and tell them that, that they are controlled and they have the opportunity to go to But there, there are a lot of possibilities. Well, I, I think, it, as I but said, it, it depends on exactly what it is that you're, you're doing. Well, the other possibility is if you are sort of in contact with your cohort in some way, the cohort websites, study website, you can put information out that we're now doing this study. I think that touches on the, on the very yeah. Um, yeah. essence yeah. of, of, of mm -hmm. Twix. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would really like to hear your opinion about that. Um, I was interested as well that you said um, telling people that they are controlled might depend on uh, what the intervention is and how much, almost how much preference there is for that intervention, which again I sort of thought went against what you said on the first day, Claire, of why this design came about, mm -hmm. because there was a strong patient preference for an intervention, <coughs> no evidence that that intervention was the right one or not, and if you left it to patient choice, you wouldn't be able to do the trial, but the trial needs to be done to find out whether the intervention works. Um, I thought that's quite interesting, mine is, mine is a CTEMP, it's a, it's a medicinal intervention, in a condition where there are very few treatment options. So if I gave the choice to my patients, they would all want it, and the trial couldn't be done. But if I consent, or if I tell my controls that they're in a trial and not getting it, then it remove, you know, they're straight away disappointed, and, mm -hmm. and, and that will affect their, their, their outcomes, I think. So it's, I was really interested by that. I wonder what anyone else thinks. Yeah, I was actually thinking if you do that, when you're back to the double consent um, uh, sealant design, where you inform both the intervention group and the control group um, in which group they are after they are being randomized. And in that case, I would argue that you have to offer the intervention to the control group as well. Um, because otherwise they are being randomized and then told about. And then basically you, you call up your patient and you tell them like, well, you're, you have this intervention that you may benefit from, but we don't know yet. But I mean, you're eligible for it. But you can't get it. <laughs> you still want to be in the control group and have a nice day, basically. Okay? <laughs> I don't think yeah. that's, no, uh, that's a very good option. I think my conception here is that we have, a, we have a cohort of people who are already essentially on board with being research participants in various ways, and it's very important what it is, sort of the initial consent when you set this thing up is very important because it sets down all the parameters for what you promise people to do in the future. Uh, and if it is in a, in a context where sort of you're, you're going to, to do studies for which people might have, have these strong preferences, maybe you need to be sort of upfront about this as well. That uh, that sort of part of why we're doing this is that down the line there will be these things, uh, and of course we we know from the literature uh, that especially in in cases of uh, very severe illnesses that the re a main reason for choosing to participate in RCTs is that you hope to get the new treatments and. A main reason for choosing to refuse is that in one of the arms there is 
a side effects mentioned that you do not want. Uh, 